We begin a new series today entitled Home Run Living, and we love to look back. And you know, I, as I look at that video, I realized why I didn't make it to the major leagues. I never played leapfrog over the other players. I had no idea that was how you got to the major leagues. Had I known that, I'd have done that. But we began a new series uh, studying the book of 1 Peter. And really, it, we began last week by looking at Peter's life, some of his, uh, some of his amazing victories and amazing failures. And we love to look at uh, old scenes like this, black and white scenes of a pitcher celebrating a, a big win or a home run or some great play. But the reality of it is for every one of those, there are 10 on the other side. It's been said time and time and time again, uh, rightly so, that even the best hitters in the major leagues fell seven out of 10 times. And you don't think of that as being the major leagues. You're like, they're the best of the best. They succeed every time. But that is not reality. Even the best in the major leagues fell seven out of ten times. And over the next couple of weeks, uh, uh, we have done uh, here at Cottonwood, we have taken the book of 1 Peter. Now, let me remind you of something I said last week. And if you were in one of our Easter services, you'll remember that the book of Peter, uh, 1 Peter, was written in response to Jesus' challenge to Peter to feed my sheep. What happened is, uh, you remember Peter, uh, uh, with all of his major victories, with all of the successes in his life as being a follower of Jesus Christ, had uh, uh, a major failure where he denied Christ not once, not twice, but three times. And then Christ was taken off and executed. You remember, we looked, about it, looked at it last week in John chapter 20, uh, when uh, uh, the ladies had come back and reported to the disciples that Jesus was risen, his grave was empty. Peter and John ran to the tomb, but John stopped. Peter ran in, wanting to know if he could still find grace, meet uh, the one he loved, Jesus. But he didn't see him there, but he was gone. Peter went back and did exactly what he knew to do, which was go back to fish. And then I love John chapter 21, where Jesus actually sought Peter out. And he asked him the question, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. Then he said, Peter, again, do you love me? And Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. And then a third time, he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, Lord, you know I love you three times because he had denied him three times. But he said, Lord, you know I love you. And then Jesus made these words, feed my sheep. If you look through the book of Acts, you can, you can see some amazing uh, things that Peter did throughout his life. You can see uh, greatest, uh, most prominent preacher at Pentecost. You can see uh, him uh, uh, leading the church. You can see him healing people. You can see him challenging the religious and political leaders of the day. Boy, from that, from that point on, Peter's life seems to excel because of his encounter with Christ. But if you look at a certain point in Peter's life, he stopped, sat down, and he thought about you and he thought about me. And he reflected on the words of Christ, feed my sheep. And Peter stopped and wrote this amazing book of 1 Peter. And so what we've done as a church is we have broken down the book of 1 Peter. And over the next five weeks, we've split the book in half. I will preach half of the book, and our life group teachers, life group at home and life group on, uh, at church, they will teach the other half. If all you do over the next five weeks is come to the worship services, you're going to miss half of what Peter said in response to Jesus' words, feed my sheep. If you only come to life group over the next five weeks, you're going to miss half of what Peter said to the believers. If you look at the beginning of 1 Peter chapter 1, it's not on your insert there, but if you open it up in, in your Bible, you'll see Peter says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the exiles. See, if you go back to Acts chapter 8, what was happening is the church was growing and God was blessing and the Spirit was moving in. What you see is that the church was being persecuted. Christians and believers were being persecuted. And Scripture says as they were persecuted, they were scattered in out into all the villages and surrounding areas and surrounding territories, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, persecution of the church 
caused the church to scatter, which also caused those that were scattered to carry the gospel into places that it otherwise wouldn't have gone. So listen, persecution can be good. Suffering can be good. And so Peter says, I want to write to the exiles, you who believe in Jesus Christ, who have trusted Christ as Savior and Lord. He goes, I want to encourage you to be obedient to the Word of God. Man, a lot of times we don't talk about that in the Christian walk, in the Christian circle. But part of my call as not just a pastor, but as a believer in Jesus Christ, is to be obedient in all areas of my life. But he says you need to be obedient to Christ because why? You were sprinkled with his blood. That's what happened at Calvary. When Jesus hung on the cross and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. When he hung on the cross and said, it is finished, Jesus was saying, my blood has paid for your sins and your sins and your sins and mine. Therefore, we can live in a different way. So for the next five weeks, I want to invite you to make a commitment to be here present or be here online, get involved in a life group or a life group at home. And let's see what the Apostle Peter said. And I want to remind you, it was his direct response to Jesus' challenge, feed my sheep. In other words, Peter wrote this book to you and to me. Yes, it was addressed to some of those uh, persecuted and scattered believers that were in the first century, but it's also written to you and me. And I want to talk to you today as we begin by Looking at the series Home Run Living, I, I want to talk to you on a message entitled Being Called Up to the Big Leagues. I never got to experience that. But can you imagine being somewhere, getting off a bus in the middle of nowhere in a pretty ratty little baseball park, and all of a sudden you get a phone call and it's the general manager of the major league team and says, Hey, listen, get your stuff, go to the airport. What would you do? Immediately, I, you, first you would say, okay, is it April's Fool's? Am I being spoofed? Second thing, you, you'd start calling your mom. These days, uh, uh, they would post it on Twitter, just got a call, put it on Facebook. They would do all of these things to communicate. We'd get excited. We'd do exactly what they say. Go grab the bags. You'd go find a, uh, an airplane ticket. You would get to the major league team as quickly as you could. You'd walk in. They would immediately, you'd walk in. They'd have a locker for you with, with your jersey and your name and your number. Today, these days, what would you do? First thing you do, take a picture. That's mine. You'd put it on and all of a sudden you'd look around and, and instead of traveling on a bus, you'd be on a plane. Instead of having $4 a day to eat, they would have a buffet out there before that. I mean, it would be great. But the reality of it is Peter says everyone who's a believer in Jesus Christ has been called up to the major leagues. Whether we act like it or not. The theme verse for our series is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. I want to put it on the screen, and I want to encourage us to read it together. Now, remember, I, I told you that I'll preach half, and our life group teachers will teach the other half. I want you to know the way we've broken it up, that our life group teachers and our life groups at home and in campus, they will actually be teaching this verse in the life groups next week. So if you miss a life group, you're going to miss out on this primary passage in the book. But look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. I want to invite us to stand as we read this verse, and I want to encourage everybody here to memorize it. And notice what it says. Let's read it together on the count of three. One, two, three. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You may be seated there where you are. Now, as you look at that passage, it says, you are a chosen a priesthood, a holy God's own possession, that we should do what? Look at it. That we should be the ones that proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his light. Part of God's call on my life and on your life as believers is that we would understand, first of all, the first part of that verse, we'd understand who we are, but then secondly, we would understand what we're supposed to do, which is to proclaim 
to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. My guess is from time to time as God's children, you say, I, I don't feel very chosen or I don't feel very royal or I don't feel that holy. Anybody ever felt that way? I know I do from time to time. I'm like, God, I thought you chose me. I, I thought you called me, God. God, I thought you told me I was a, a royal priesthood. I tell, How can I be so broke if I'm so royal? You know, how can I be so holy with what's going on in my life or your life? We need to understand that that's who we are. Regardless of what's going on around us, therefore, it should change everything about us. I had the opportunity a couple of weeks ago to sit on the sidelines of a soccer game with uh, a, a man who had been a Major League Baseball scout, had received a, I think, a, a I think the way he put it, I've received a check from Major League Baseball the last 27 years. And I thought it was interesting as a scout, and I was thinking 27 years, now he didn't scout me. Uh, but I thought, well, tell me, you know, it's got to be hard to, 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 to choose among all the baseball players, all the athletes, who's ready? And he, he made a statement. He goes, you may or may not have heard this statement, but he said, it's true. He says, part of the scouting process begins before they ever get on the field. He said, here's the phrase we talk about. You scout them off the bus. And I was like, what? He goes, when the big league team says, hey, we're thinking about calling so-and-so up, I want you to go get one last look at him before we make the decision between this guy and this kid. We're going to call up another shortstop. We're going to call up another right-handed hitter. We're going to call up a left hand. He goes, I want you to fly to this city, and it's usually in the middle of nowhere in a double-A place or even a triple-A place. And he goes, I want you to look at this. He goes, when I go there with that, he goes, the first thing I do is I go and get in the parking lot before the bus arrives. And he goes, and I scout them off the bus. And he goes, I can usually tell when they get off of the bus if they're ready for the major leagues or not. He goes, do, do it, does it just look like they can handle what's about to happen to them? Does it look like they carry themselves with a confidence? Can they overcome defeat in their life? He says, do they look like it? See, the reality of it is, he says, when someone's becoming major league ready, it changes their appearance. It changes the way they walk. It changes the way they talk. He wasn't talking about arrogance. And I thought, how appropriate for us. I mean, if we are truly going to be a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy, it's got to change us, folks. People ought to be able to step back and look at us and say, there is something different about them. There is something unique about that individual, about him or her or, or about that marriage or, or, or that marriage. They ought to be able to scout us off the bus. They may not know at first what it is that is our core value, but they ought to be able to see that something is different, that we're not like everybody else. It should change how we talk, how we act. It should change our marriages. It changes the way we handle our finances. It changes our relationship. It changes everything. Why? Well, it changes it because I'm, a chose, I'm part of a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Listen to this. That I have a job to do, which is to, pro to proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Man, I have been taken from darkness that overwhelms me in this world sometimes into God's amazing light. Now, that's incredible. That's an incredible thought, and it needs to change everything about us. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, and I want to read the first couple of verses. And so today, I, I want to talk to you about two different things as it relates to our calling to the big leagues, and I'm talking spiritually. One, it offers some amazing benefits, but it doesn't prevent us from encountering difficulties. But look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 5, I'm going to look at, and we're going to talk about some of the benefits of being called up to the major leagues. That's salvation, by the way. It says this, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in His great mercy, He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance, listen to this, that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept for you in heaven, who through the faith, listen to this, are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Now,
Now let's just look at those few verses, verse 3, verse 4, and verse 5, and let's look at some of the benefits that we achieve or we attain or have given to us simply by our salvation. All right? Simply by our salvation. Number one, it begins with a new birth. Man, everything about that passage starts with one thing and one thing only is your new birth in Christ. Now, the new birth is not going to church. It's not growing up in church. It's not having gone to church in the past. It's not showing up at Easter or showing up at Christmas Eve. That's not it. Man, our benefits begin with a new birth in Christ. Just like I have a physical birthday. There was a day that I was born. There has to have been a time, a season in your life where you transitioned into a new birth spiritually. What does that mean? That means in your mind, in your heart, that you fully understood and comprehended, first of all, that you are a sinner. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If your mindset still is... That you know what, uh, you know, I'm good enough. God's going to accept me. You haven't gotten the new birth. You haven't figured out what salvation is all about. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us come way short. We don't measure up. Jesus said, if you want to get to heaven on your own, here's your only call. He says, be ye therefore perfect, for your Father in heaven is perfect. If you're perfect, you don't need this message. But the reality of it is the Bible says for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What does that mean? There is a chasm between me and God that I cannot traverse, that I cannot overcome with good. I can't get there. I can't. Paul also says in Romans chapter 6 verse 23, for the wages or the price tag of my sin is one thing, death. But there has to come a time in your life where you've heard the gospel. What is the gospel? It's the good news. Here it is, that God loved you so much and me so much that before you and I ever took a breath in this world, God loved you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus in John chapter 3, verse 16, put it this way, for God so loved the world, and you can insert your name and my name, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, that means trust in him, has eternal life. That's what brings new birth. When I realize there is nothing that I can do to be good enough for God to love me. But because of His grace, He has sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to ultimately die on the cross for me. Here's the way Paul put it. Look in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Let me put it to you this way. Paul explains it this way. He says, as for you, now Paul is talking to the Ephesian believers, the, 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 the Christians there in the church uh, in the Ephesus area that young Timothy was, would, would, would preach at. He says, as for you, he says, you were dead in your transgressions and sin. You want to know what that word dead means? It means dead. I don't know if you've noticed, like, you, when you're dead, you can't do much. How many of you have noticed that just a bit? Paul didn't say you were dying and then you received grace. Paul didn't say you looked a little sick and you needed grace. Paul said you were dead. Dead people can't do anything. There's nothing that I could have done to brought a new, bring about a new birth in my life. I couldn't have been good enough. I couldn't have done enough good works. I couldn't have gone to church good enough. Why? Because I was dead, and dead means dead. A lot of times what we do is we look around the world and, and, and we, we look at decay. Let me tell you what, when, you dead, when you're dead, there, there, are, there are many different levels of being, uh, of being uh, in decay. We call those the Mortis brothers, Alger Mortis, Rigor Mortis, all of those guys. That's just different levels of decay, but dead has already happened. Man, Paul says, listen, you and I were dead. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. So, for those who are believers here... We have to call back and be reminded in our life that when we're talking to non-believers, they're dead. When it comes to salvation and God's grace and God's love, they're not going to understand the spiritual things. 
But for us, we also have to be reminded in humility, don't ever get to a place where you think you earned your salvation because you were good enough for this. No, if we have salvation, it's because of a gracious and awesome and amazing God. And so Paul says, you were dead in your transgressions and sin. Paul wanted to remind the Ephesian believers, you were dead. He goes, but look at these next words, verse 4. But because of His great love, God's great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. Now notice those words grace and mercy. Sometimes we confuse those and, and we want to say it's this and we want to say it's that. And, you know, it, it really, uh, it, it's a God thing all the way through. Mercy has the idea of having compassion or pity on somebody. Grace has the idea of just sacrificial love for someone. If, if you're a Peanuts follower of the cartoon, man, um, loving, loving Lucy, that's grace. Loving Charlie Brown, that's mercy. It's kind of having pity on him. Regardless of who you put yourself into, you need to understand that for us to be saved, every one of us had to have received God's grace and God's mercy. Why? Because we were dead. But it was God who chose to what? God made us alive together with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And we love to jump down to verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. How are we saved? Through faith. Through faith. But not only that. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. Are we saved by works? Answer is... No. Why? We were dead. We are saved by God's grace and God's mercy and by faith that was given to each and every one of us. That's where it is. You say, so works don't matter at all, pastor? Uh, uh, I don't have to serve. I don't have to do this. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. Because if you look at verse 10, put it up on the screen. Paul tells us works matter in the kingdom of God. Remember what we said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Our job, after we realize that we're a holy nation, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, what do we have to do? We have to understand that our call is to proclaim the excellencies of Him who called us out of darkness and into life. That's where our good works come in. And so that's why he says, listen, you were dead. You were dead in your transgressions, but God made us alive through faith in Jesus Christ that he gave to us. Our salvation is a gift to us. So where do works come in? They're part of the proclamation process of the gospel. Saying, man, I want to proclaim his excellencies because he called me out of the darkness and placed me in the light. And he says here in verse 10, For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So when God made us alive, he said, now, go serve, go proclaim, go love, go care, go preach the gospel. He says, what? You are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Well, what good works are we talking about? Which God prepared in advance for us to do. Man, what a thought. That my being called up to the major leagues spiritually is not simply going from double A to the majors or triple A to the majors or the rookie league to the majors or from college or high school to the majors. Man, it, it, it means that I've been taken from the morgue to the mansion. Spiritually, I've been taken from the morgue spiritually to God's mansion. And that ought to change everything about us. Man, when you walk into the office, people ought to be able to scout you through the door. I don't know what it is, but there's something different. Man, when we walk into our neighborhoods or in our schools or people hear us talk or people see our marriages, they ought to be able to scout us off the bus. They ought to see, I don't know what it is about them, but there's just something different. Man, what's different is I understand that I once was dead and now, now I'm alive. I've never had the experience, but some have. That they've actually been resuscitated after being on the operating table or after an amazing accident or something. And let me tell you, it usually changes their life. The way they talk and the way they act and the way they live. 
Every one of us spiritually who has trust Christ as Savior and Lord has had that same experience. We've gone from a morgue to a mansion. Man, it ought to change us. My prayer is over the next couple of weeks, you get changed and I get changed so that we can truly, as we journey in our communities and in our neighborhoods, people can begin to scout us off the bus that there is something different about us. So the first thing that being called up to the major league spiritually, it starts with a new birth. You were dead, now you're alive. Number two, it gives us a living hope. It gives us a living hope. We have a vibrant, active, alive, uh, uh, cheerful, joyful hope. Man, look at these words. If we look back to 1 Peter chapter 1, he says, Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in his great mercy has given us a new birth. That's what we just looked at. Listen to this. Into a living hope. Now back to the dead and alive. Where did we get that living hope? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There's the idea from dead to alive, from the morgue to a mansion. He says, listen, you and I have a vibrant, active, living hope. Man, we don't have a dead hope. We don't have a dead hope. One of the greatest things we hear about and read about is people just need to be given hope, given hope, given hope, given... And you know what? People need hope. But if you haven't noticed, people can't get lasting hope from the government. You and I can't get lasting, vibrant, active hope from our employer. We can't get lasting, vibrant hope from the doctor. You ever gone into the doctor and say, how am I doing today? And they'll say, oh, you're doing good. You look good. Just look your doctor in the eye and hey, says, listen, I'm doing so good. What's my long-term fate? And they're going to look at you and say, how long-term? I mean, what's my ultimate end? The doctor's not going to say, hey, you know, it appears to me that you're going to be the one that lives and lasts forever. No, we don't want to ask those quick because there is no living hope. He says, we have a living, vibrant, cheerful, joyful hope. A living hope, what? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Man, that's where it is. Notice what the writer of the book of Hebrews said. You want to talk about our hope? Our hope doesn't fade. It doesn't wane. It doesn't matter. Our hope as God's children doesn't matter what goes on in the Ukraine, although we're interested. It doesn't matter what goes on in the Middle East, although we're interested and it matters. Our hope, look at what he Hebrews chapter 6 says, we have this hope as an anchor for our soul that is both firm and secure. Man, there are times that you and I are going to experience tsunamis in life and we're going to experience uh, uh, hurricanes and whirlwinds and all of these things. But he says, listen, our hope is a vibrant, active, cheerful hope that regardless of what comes my way, I'm going to be okay because God is in control. How do we know that? Because my hope isn't anchored into something in this world. It's anchored into God's Word and ultimately anchored by God Himself, firm and secure. So the first thought, when you talk about home run living, it comes after a new birth, it comes with a living hope, and it results in a guaranteed contract. Write that down. You and I have a guaranteed contract. What's a guaranteed contract? It's a contract that's guaranteed. You might want to write that down. Isn't that genius? That means that there can't come a day when I no longer can, can perform that my contract is null and void and I'm cut. Man, we're going to talk about eternal security more and more as we go through uh, the next couple of weeks. But we understand that God, once I have moved from being dead to life, that God has given me and you the Holy Spirit as a deposit for all of eternity. Man, that is a guaranteed contract. That is an absolute guaranteed contract. You say, where do you see that? Turn back to 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's look at it real, real quick here. He says, we have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 4. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Listen to this. This inheritance is kept for you in heaven. Man, once we have been called up to the major leagues, once you have trusted Christ as Savior and Lord, it comes at a new birth, 
It has a living hope, and we have a guaranteed contract. What's the guaranteed contract? That there is a place in heaven reserved for me. How many of you are glad about that? I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what it looks like, but, but here's the neat thing. If you can just picture in your mind's eye, when you think about home run living over the next couple of weeks, there is a chair in heaven with your name on it. That is a great thing, isn't it? Now, I don't know what your chair looked like. I, I just looked at some Google, Google images this week, and I said, I wonder what my chair is going to look like. Anybody ever wonder what your chair is going to look like? I got, I got a couple. Let's put this. It might look like this. I don't know. That might, that might be your chair. Now, I, I don't know who those people sitting to the left or the right are, but I got the good chair, right? I, I don't know that might. And now I thought, well, what might some people in our church, what, their, what would their chair might look like? I thought, for those of you who sit in the back of the church, I said, I wonder kind of what their chair might look like when they get to heaven. Here's what I thought it might look like. God's going to say, for all those times you sat in the back of the church, sit here for eternity. I thought, what about those people that are always the ones, you've heard the statement, uh, 20% of the people do all, 80% of the work in church, or 10% of the people do 90% of the work in church. What about those people that serve, 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 serve? What is their, their chair going to look like in heaven? I think it might look like this. They're going to finally get to sit down, eat popcorn, and watch the other 90% serve them for eternity. What about, I said, well, what about those people? How many of you think it's loud in the church? You can tell the truth. You can tell the truth now. You think it's just too loud? We had a bunch more people in the 930 raise their hands. Either they were still awake or whatever, but they, they, they thought. I thought, for those people who think it's loud in church, it's going to be real loud in heaven. So here's what your chair is going to look like. Just kind of a little cone over your head so it'll never be too loud. But here's the point. You have a guaranteed contract. There is a name written on a seat for you in heaven. You say, what's it look like? Go back to 1 Peter chapter 1. I want to point out a couple of things. 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at an inheritance that will never perish. Everybody say never perish. Look at the next word, never spoil. Everybody say never spoil. Look at these next words, and it will never fade. Everybody say that. Man, there's not an inheritance on this earth. I don't care how rich your dad is or your granddad is. There is not an inheritance on this earth that can't fade away, that can't spoil, that can't go away. That's why if you look over in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, listen, when you're building up treasures and you're building up an inheritance, don't just look to build up an inheritance for your kids. Don't just look to build up an inheritance for, for, for those who will follow you. He says, put your treasure in the right place. Look at Matthew chapter 6. Jesus said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Listen to this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Man, your treasure, our treasure as God's children is ultimately in heaven is ultimately in heaven. So listen, being called up to the major leagues, your spiritual growth starts with a new birth. It brings a living hope. It has an inheritance and a guaranteed contract that will never fade away. And listen, it is protected by God's power. Write that down. It is protected by God's power. In other words, your calling as God's child out of darkness and into his mar marvelous life is protected by God. Look back to 1 Peter chapter 1. Here's what it says. Who through faith are shielded by God's power. Isn't that great to know? That, that, that the spiritual force field protecting me is God's power. It's not how strong I am. It's not how faithful I am. It is God's power. What is protecting my inheritance? It's God's power. It was the blood of Jesus Christ that, that was shed for me on the cross. The faith that I have, the trust that I have in Jesus Christ, that he died and was buried, rose again the third day. Therefore, God's power protects everything. You say, Pastor, 
I don't get this. I, I don't fully understand what does it mean to spend eternity in heaven and an inheritance that won't fade away and enjoy my new birth. And you, 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 you think about what's heaven going to be like. You ever just sat there and pondered how awesome heaven, heaven will be? How amazing heaven would be, streets of gold or this or that, beyond the crystal sea as we sang this morning uh, in uh, Deacon's meeting, as we sang, just those, those things. Have you ever pondered? But I was thinking this week as I step back, say, so God is protecting my inheritance and me through faith and it will never fade away. I begin to think, how awesome is that going to be? And I really began to ponder this week and laugh, what will heaven be like? And I began to think about some things that I wanted to share with you, and then I thought, you know, it's going to be better than that. <laughs> and I'd think about something else, and I'd think, you know, it's going to be better than that. And then I was reminded of what Paul said, the apostle in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look at it. Paul says, however it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. God. That means I can sit and ponder and ponder and ponder for seven days a week, 24 hours a day, every day the rest of my life of how amazing God's glory and God, how amazing God's heaven's going to be and how amazing the angels are going to sing. I can, I can think about that, but I'm not even close. I'm not even close. And see, Peter tells us all that up front because what he's about to tell us, he wants us to always be reminded that it pales in comparison to what is waiting for us. You see, being called up to the major leagues has some major benefits. But it doesn't prevent difficulties from coming our way. How many of you understand and you know that believers suffer and struggle and we're persecuted? Man, that is it. Look at these words, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. In all this, you greatly rejoice. Now, notice what we're doing here. If you're new here, we're going verse by verse, line by line. That's what we do here, and that's what they're going to do in the life groups and in home groups. But notice, so now Peter has said... There are amazing blessings that are waiting for you. But he also says, but in this, right now, remember how I told you at the beginning, he started off talking to those who were scattered, those who were persecuted, those who, who were being killed. He says, in this, you can greatly rejoice. What's the in this? In this, that's all the words that I've just read. Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Verse 7. He says, these have come so that you've been, so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result, listen to these words, in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Look at verse 8. Though you have not seen him, Jesus, none of us have visibly, visibly seen him, you love him. Him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible joy. Listen to this, and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now just leave it right here for a second. Now notice this. Remember Peter's, Peter's response to Jesus saying, feed my sheep, was that he wrote First Peter. Now notice right here he mentions you and me. He says, even though you do not see him now, we don't have that privilege of seeing Christ. We don't have the same privilege that Peter had of seeing a risen Christ who he just felt like he had let down, he had denied him, not once, not twice, but three times. Though you have not seen him, you believe in him. That's those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ. And therefore, we can be filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Why? For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, as we just think about those verses, the end result of my faith is really twofold. One is someday I will receive the salvation of my soul. 
Secondly, we saw it already in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, the theme verse that we are to hear and now proclaim the excellencies of Him who called us out of darkness and into light. So that's kind of my to twofold life. Someday I live, someday knowing that the salvation of my soul is taken care of. It's guarded with God. It, it, there's an inheritance waiting for me. There is a seed in heaven. But right now I proclaim the excellencies of God who called me out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So now, he tells us those two things to also tell us this. In your difficulties, know, know a couple of things. So I want to encourage you to just write these down. They all come from here. Ready? First of all, our difficulties. First thing that we're going to see as we look at them is that uh, uh, they're going to come. But they're going to come in various forms. Write that down. Our difficulties are going to come in various ways and in various forms. That means that the difficulty that comes your way and the difficulty that comes my way won't be the same. Boy, if you look over my life and you look at what's been, through, been going on in my life or where the family that I grew up in or, or what took place, man, I had some hardships and some difficulties and some persecutions that, that you don't experience. Why? Yours come in different shapes and different sizes and different colors and different this. Your def difficulties might be financial while someone else over here has one that is physical and someone else has oh, one over here that's a family and one over here is a, a marriage and somebody else's health and somebody is this. Man, they come in multiple, a multitude of ways. Peter didn't say, hey, when that one trial comes your way, you know what, it comes to all of us. It's this one trial and it always comes this way. He didn't say that. He says, man, as God's children, we're always under attack. We're always struggling here and there. What did James, the brother of Jesus, say about the various forms of our trials and our difficulties? James chapter 1, verse 2, put it up here. He says, consider it pure joy. There's that word joy again. Peter said, inexpressible and glorious joy. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Well, what kind of trials are going to come your way and what kind of trials are going to come my way? Many kinds. But here's the good news. You ready? Regardless of the trial that comes your way, it has, write this down, a limited duration. Write it down. None of our trials last eternity. None of our trials last for eternity. He says, in this, Peter said, back in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, he says, in this you greatly rejoice, the blessings that we have, even though now for a little while you must suffer all kinds of grief or very form, various forms of grief. He says, listen, regardless of what you're going through, remember it's temp temporary. You know the phrase, this too shall pass. And guess what? When this one passes, there's another one coming, right? And then it'll pass, and there'll be another one coming. And then it'll pass, be another one coming. And you know, sometimes when trials come our way, we can see them coming from a miles away. You just know it's coming. Man, sometimes it comes with a phone call in the night. It comes with just a hiccup in life. And all of a sudden, completely and totally unprepared, there it is, right there. Boy, as you think about limited duration, go back to verse 6. Let me just read it to you real quick, First Peter chapter 1. He says, you must suffer grief in all kinds, but he says, though now for a little while. You say, Pastor, it doesn't seem like a little while. Matter of fact, I've, I've had people that, that sit in my office rightly so and say, you know, I, I know that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through difficulties. I'm going to go through hardships. But, you know, how can I handle the trials that are coming my way? And I know it's supposed to be just a little while, Pastor. But it seems like such a long time. See, it's just a little while in comparison to the eternal glory we are going to experience in heaven. See, my trials, just like that, compared to an eternal weight of glory. But he tells us something else about our trials, and I encourage you to write this down. They have refining qualities to them. When God allows trials and hardships and difficulties to come our way, they have refining qualities. Look back to 1 Peter chapter 1. You see it, these have come, the trials, 
the suffering, the grief, the hardship, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith would be of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire. You say, well, what does he mean there, Pastor? Well, if you know anything about the mining process of gold, here's what they do with gold. Is when they mine gold, anybody in here a gold miner? Okay, darn. It'd be great if one of y'all owned a gold mine. We'd work there just on weekends and stuff with you. But what they do is when they, when they mine gold, they never mine pure 24 karat gold. It's always got some junk in it. And so they mine the gold, they pull it out, they run it through these conveyor belts, they shake it, they water it, they rattle it, they roll it, they do all of those things. Uh, and then what do they do? They begin to melt it. And when they melt it, especially in those days, when they melt it, the junk just kind of rises to the top and the gold becomes pure. Now, what is pure gold? Pure gold is what we call 24 karat gold. That means 24 parts of 24 parts of that gold is fully gold. Most of us, if we have gold rings, it's going to be 12 karat gold or 18 karat gold or whatever. You say, well, pastor, what do they do? Well, what happens is after all the junk is taken out, pure 24 karat gold is too soft and malleable to really be used for anything. So then they add an alloy back into it to strengthen it up. And so that's how you'll come up with uh, 12 karat gold, which is 50% actual gold, 50% alloy. He's strong enough. And then you have 18 karat gold, which is about uh, uh, two-thirds gold and a third alloy. Why do they do that? They strengthen it up. Here's what God is saying. When he allows a, he allows a test to come my way or he allows a suffering or a hardship or a struggling to come my way, he's heating me up. And then he's taking the junk out of my life. Because let me tell you what, if you want to know if there's junk in your life, man, you just, you just let the pressure come, amen? You let the heat get turned up. High. Just let someone pull out in front of you on 75, right? All right, there goes the dross. So God heats us up, then he scoops off the bad stuff. And in that suffering and in that trial and in that difficulty, the alloy of God's life and God's provision and God's grace comes into our life to strengthen us up so we can be used for His glory. So many believers and so many Christians don't want to suffer and don't want to struggle and don't want to go through it. But listen, if you don't go through trials, you're never purified. Man, you, you want to know, you've heard the statement, if you want to know what a person's really worth, watch them under pressure. That's what, spiritually, you want to know how strong a person's faith really is, watch them when times get tough. Watch them, everybody can be a really, really good Christian when things are going really, really good. But God takes us through the refining fire to purify our faith. Go back to what James, the brother of Jesus, said. Notice this. You say, what is some of the alloy that God puts in our lives? Here it is. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. There's a different kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, alloy, strength in our faith. And perseverance must fi finish its work so that what? So that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Man, when God brings that to us, it brings strength to us. And then finally, the last thing, listen to this. What do we do? We have to realize that our trials and tribulations should always result, result in praise and joy. It should always result in praise and joy. Now listen to this. Go back to verse 7. We're going to close quickly. Here it is. It says, Though refined by fire may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Let me ask you a question. When hardships and struggles come your way, do you curse God or bless Him? Do you curse God or bless Him? No one in here has ever experienced what Job experienced, and I pray it never happens. But do we have the walk and the faith of Job? who can ultimately at the end of the book say, I'm not God, you are. Therefore, I will bring you praise. 
Boy, as you think about it, as we move through this book, Peter just opens up today and he starts by telling about our new birth into a living hope and a seat that is reserved for each and every one of us. And we love that talk. But he also acknowledges the reality of living in this world. There will be trials. There will be difficulties. But here's what you need to know. Every one of those difficulties be, becomes an alloy in your faith that will strengthen you and make you stronger so that you can proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his light. I want to invite you just to bow your heads there where you are. And as we close right now this service, I want to invite our altar team to the, to the front. And my guess is there's some folks here today that you are going through some amazing difficulties, some hardships, whether it is financial, physical, perhaps it's marriage, maybe it's relationships, maybe it's occupational, maybe I hadn't even come close. To, I hadn't come close to touching on it. But my invitation to you this week is to begin to put your trial and your difficulties in perspective. That it's nothing compared to a new birth, a living hope, a guaranteed contract, a future of praise and inexpressible joy. But Peter also will tell us here in a couple of weeks that we should cast all our anxieties upon him because he cares for us. So here in a few seconds, I'm going to pray, and our altar team's going to be down front. And if you've got an anxiety, a struggle, a hardship in your life, if you just want to come and pray at the altar or pray with one of our people, you come. Maybe there's someone else here that you've never truly experienced a new birth, and you want to know what it really means to have a new birth, then you come. But when you leave the door, leave with this challenge. Let people scout you off the bus this week as a person of faith because of a changed relationship with God. It changes the way you talk, the way you walk, the way you act, and the way you live. That people can look at you and see something different. Father, my prayer for your people as we begin this Major League Living series that we would realize that you've called us up to the big leagues with incredible blessings, with some difficulties and grief. But we can live with the full understanding that there is an eternal weight of glory waiting for us in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.